Hello everybody, welcome back. In this tutorial we're going to be covering quiz number 32 which introduces the rayleigh ritz method. Now, luckily for you guys, this is the last topic of CIVI 398. Of course we have a finite element topic but that's just more for your guys' information as finite element analysis is rather complex, it's more of a graduate topic. So when you guys are referring to your final exam, this will be the last real topic on your final exam. So that's good. We're almost done. You guys can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, the question becomes, what is the rayleigh ritz method? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Well, luckily for you guys, it's actually pretty easy to do. And why do we do it? Well, it allows us to solve for approximations of displacement functions when we deal with continuums. Now, this is great because, again, this course, the differential equations we've dealt with, they're often pretty simple. Therefore, we can find the exact solution. However, in real life, not really the case. Therefore, we use approximation methods to try and uh, approximate <laughs> the deflection without using too much computational power. All right, so that's kind of the background of why we're doing this. Let's jump into the theory. So the key to this unit is going to be potential energy. Why is that, Clayton? Well, the rayleigh ritz method is used to approximate displacement functions based on minimizing this potential energy of the system. You say, all right, well, that doesn't sound too bad, but how do we calculate this potential energy? Well, it's actually quite simple. The potential energy of a system is simply the total strain energy of the system minus the work done on the system by external forces. So if we look at these two components, the total strain energy, which I have in red here, well, we covered that a lot actually back in assignment number eight. And you guys should be very familiar with total strain energy for linear elastic isotropic systems. And the work done on a system, well, we kind of covered that in the last assignment when we talked about virtual work. So when it comes to potential energy, it's composed of two terms. And by this point, you guys should be experts in calculating those two terms. But in case you forget, let's go over them. So in this course, we basically have three situations. The first situation is a linear elastic isotropic continuum. Hey guys, hold on, Clayton. A, a what? That, that thing looks crazy. I don't remember that. Well, this is essentially just a plate. Remember when we dealt with plates, we basically say that it's a nice linear elastic isotropic continuum. So in this case, our potential energy is simply the total strain energy, which we know how to get. All we have to do is simply integrate the strain energy density function, that u with a bar on top, but I simplified it into its summation there. And we're gonna minus the work done by either the traction vectors Tn or the body forces rho b on the system. If we look at this formula, it's not too bad at all. The one thing that we're going to have to keep in mind is when we're looking at those work terms, the traction vector and the body force vector rho b, they're dotted with the displacement. They're not multiplied by the displacement function. They're actually dotted with the displacement functions. So that's something to keep in mind. And that'll make sense once we actually get into these calculations, because if we don't dot them, well, then we're integrating vectors. And that just makes no sense at all. So you guys are going to see that a lot uh, when we get to question two of this quiz. Now, why is this so nice, finding the potential energy of a system? Well, if we know that for a stable equilibrium, this potential energy must be uh, minimum, what we can do is we can take our potential energy equation, take the derivative of it, and set it equal to zero. Why is this nice? Well, we have an equation. And what do we do with equations? We can solve for the unknowns. All right, so not too bad. And again, this is going to be kind of the, the most general case. But in this course, we dealt with beams a lot too. So sometimes if we have a general case, we can actually simplify it uh, for specific cases. And that's what we're going to do here with beams. So again, the formula for the potential energy remains the exact same where we're taking that total strain energy and subtracting the work done on the system by the external loads. So the first uh, beam scenario that we covered was a beam under axial loading. So if we want the potential energy of the system here, it actually simplifies into the integral over the length of the beam uh, uh, of Ea divided by two, multiplied by the derivative of the displacement function squared. So that's gonna be the internal strain energy. And of course, we minus the work done on the system. And all we're doing is multiplying that external load by its corresponding displacement. So for instance, if I'm looking at the distributed load there in the center, I'm integrating that distributed load P over the length of the beam, multiplying it by the displacement, and that is simply the work done. And we can do the same thing for the concentrated loads F. We take our concentrated load F, multiply it by, by the displacement at that point, 
we have the work done. So that's easy peasy, nothing too crazy. And we have our other case where we have Euler Bernoulli beams. So these are the beams subjected to bending. So again, we can find our total strain energy. If we look inside there, we know how to calculate all those parameters. L, we're typically given. EI, again, typically given. The only real unknown that you guys may struggle with is that deflection function Y. But again, we know how to calculate that. It's not too bad at all. And then we're basically, again, subtracting all of the forces multiplied by their corresponding displacements. Or in the case of a concentrated moment, it's rotation. So as you guys can see from the formulas, they're not too bad at all. You guys are experts. You guys will have no problems with this topic. And to show you guys how easy it is, let's jump into the quiz. Alrighty, guys, welcome to the quiz. As you guys are going to see this quiz, not a long quiz, not a short quiz, probably somewhere in between. Uh, the quiz itself, three questions long, not too bad of questions. Definitely questions you guys can expect to see on your, I was going to say midterm, but by this point, it'll definitely be your final. All right, guys, let's jump into it. Question number one and two, I'm going to do right here on the iPad. Question number three is kind of more an encompassing question where it covers basically the rayleigh ritz method as a whole. And I'm going to do that one on Mathematica so you guys can see kind of the Mathematica steps that you guys will take. And it's what you guys should be doing in your guys' assignment as well. So hopefully it'll help you guys with your assignment. All right. Before we get to question three, let's look at question number one. And question number one is basically just completing the statement. So question number one says the rayleigh ritz method is, and it gives us four different options. So all we're going to do is go through each option and say, all right, is this correct or is this incorrect? And why is it incorrect? So option A says a method to find the exact solution for the displacement in a continuum by minimizing the potential energy of the system composed of the continuum and the external forces acting on it. So as you guys know, this is definitely incorrect. So what we can do is we can put a big X there. And the reason why is it says it wants us, uh, the Rayleigh or its method is used to find the exact solution. And as we covered in the theory, this is not the case. This is typically used to find an approximate solution. Now, sometimes your approximate solution will be the exact solution, but a lot of the times it also won't be. So saying that we're always finding the exact solution, this is actually incorrect. Moving on to number B, it says a method to find an approximate solution. So again, we talked about that. We know that that's correct. For the displacement in a continuum by minimizing the internal strain energy of the continuum. So just like uh, statement A, this one's also incorrect, but not because of the approximate versus exact solution. It's because of this down here, where it says we're minimizing the internal strain energy. As you guys know, in the rayleigh ritz method, we're minimizing the potential energy, not just the internal strain energy, but the potential energy of the system. So we know that that's wrong. Moving on to statement number C, it says a method to find the exact solution, blah, blah, blah. We don't even have to read further because, again, just like statement A, it says exact solution, and we know that that is not correct. So statement C here we know is not correct. So therefore, if we eliminated A, B, and C, we already know it's going to be statement D. But let's go through it just in case, where it says a method to find an approximate solution, so we know that's true. For the displacement in a continuum by minimizing the potential energy of the system composed of the continuum and the external forces acting on it. So that's exactly what we said is true. Therefore, for question number one, we know it's going to be answer D. So question number one here, not too bad, just a nice, simple question and definitely expect a lot of those on your guys' final. Knowing the theory in this class is actually quite important, unlike many other classes. So question number two here, this is when we're going to start getting into calculating. And yes, you guys will actually see me calculate an integral by hand. I know it's very easy for me to just say, oh, take an integral, take an integral, especially when I'm using Mathematica. But by hand, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm a little bit shaky. So uh, no making fun of me. All right. So question number two says an approximate solution using the rayleigh ritz method is sought for the shown unit thickness plate. As a first step in the method, a displacement function that satisfies the essential boundary conditions is obtained as, and as we can see, we have our nice displacement function u over here, and it's composed of u1 and u2. And it says where a1, a2, a3, and a4, which are all in that uh, displacement function, are all constants. And it says if a distributed traction vector t 
which is equal to 1, 0, is applied on edge A, what is the work done by the external forces acting on edge A? So this is kind of an external work question, or work done on the system by external forces, and this has to do with the traction vector T on edge A. So we know it's going to come kind of out like this, and it's going to be something like this. So this is kind of the first step. Where is it located? That's going to be important. Why is that important? Well, let's look at the formula for the work done due to a traction vector. So as we said in the theory, the work done uh, by a traction vector can be uh, obtained using the surface integral. So we have an integral, and you say, what's the surface integral? Well, that's when you see this right here, where we're taking it over the partial domain. Now, what are we taking the integral of? Well, we're taking the integral of our attraction vector dotted with our displacement vector. And again, this is going to be over the surface. So when I look at this, I see two things. One I see is a dot product, which I'm going to have to tackle at some point. And the other one is I see an integral that makes not a lot of sense. So we're going to have to deal with both of those. The first thing I'm going to do is say, all right, well, let's solve the dot product inside. So we see that right in here, we have a dot product. And we know how to easily solve for a dot product. We take the first component of one, multiply it by the first component of the other vector, and then we add it to the second component, multiply it by the second component, etc., etc. So we say, all right, well, if I'm dotting the traction vector with the displacement vector, my first step, multiply the first components of each. So if I look at my traction vector over here, we see its first component here is one. So I'm going to have one. And then I'm going to multiply this by the first component of our displacement vector, which is this over here. So what I'm going to have is 1 multiplied by a1 times x1 plus a2 multiplied. Oops, I ended the bracket a little bit early, guys, a little bit uh, premature with my brackets, if you will. So that's the first component. So we say, all right, well, that's good. I'll, er I'll erase the circles around them. And then we say, all right, well, now we add the second components multiplied by each other. So if we look at the second component of the traction vector over there, we see that it's actually zero. So at this point, you guys already know what it's going to be, but we'll carry on just for the sake. So if we look at the second component of our displacement, we see that it's going to be A3 multiplied by X1 plus A4 multiplied by X2. All right, and again, it's obvious. For multiplying something by zero, it's going to be equal to zero. So therefore, we now know that this is simply going to be a1 times x1 plus a2 times x2. All right, guys. So let's go back to our integral, and we're going to substitute this bad boy in and make our lives a little bit easier because we went from two vectors inside of our integral now to just one nice equation. So it's still a surface integral. We're going to talk about that next here. But if we look inside, our actual integral, it doesn't look too bad. A1, X1, plus A2 multiplied by X2. And again, this is the surface integral, so we're uh, diff or integrating over the surface. So this is where things become a little bit tricky, is how do we convert this surface integral, this DS, into something that I actually know what I'm doing? And the key here is look at the diagram. So if we have our diagram here, and I'm going to actually extend it, we know that in 3D, it's going to actually look at something. Or <laughs> I say it's going to look something like this, but I'm a terrible artist, so it's probably not going to look something like this. It's going to be much cleaner, of course. But we know that our surface is something like this, and our surface is in the x2, x3 plane. All right, guys, it's in the x2, x3 plane. So therefore, I'm going to integrate over the x2, x3 plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and say, all right, well, now that we know that our surface is in the x2, x3 plane, I know I'm going to be integrating from 0 over the thickness of the plate. So that's in the x3 direction. And then we integrate again from 0 to h. So this is the height of the plate, or the x2 direction. Our function inside stays the exact same. So we got a1 multiplied by x1 plus a2 multiplied by x2. And then now, instead of ds, we know that we're integrating first over the x2 direction, and then second, we're integrating over the x3 direction. So the question becomes is, all right, if the surface is over x2 and x3, that's fine. I can take that double integral, no problem. But what about x1, Clayton? Like, uh, how are we accounting for the x1? Well, if we look at the surface up here, we can see that the whole surface 
occurs at a value of x1 is equal to 2. The whole surface is at that value. Therefore, we can substitute x1 is equal to 2 in this equation. So I'll change colors here. And what we're going to do is we say we know that x1 is equal to 2 for the whole surface. So therefore, this x1 that appears in here, we can say that this is actually going to be equal to 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the integral yet again. And I'm going to put equal signs. It's actually kind of bothering me that I don't have equal signs. I'm looking quite sloppy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say equal to. And we're going to take the integral. So the first one is across the thickness or the x3 direction. Well, it says that we have a unit thickness plate. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1. The second direction, the x2 direction, we're going from 0 over the height of the plate. And if we look up here, we see that the height of the plate is simply one unit as well. So this will be another integral from 0 to 1. I'm going to come down here, 0 to 1. At our function now, we had a1, x1. But again, we said that x1 is actually equal to 2 at every point in the surface. So what we have here is actually 2 multiplied by a1. And then we have a2 times x2. So again, that doesn't change because x2 is something we're integrating over. And then this will be with respect to x2 and then with respect to x3. So it just becomes a matter of solving this integral. As you guys are going to see, it's not too bad. I'll switch colors. What I like to do is take the first integral first. So basically, I'm just going to consider this region right here. I'm not going to worry about the x3 at all. So we know that this right here is going to be equal to 2a1. So we have basically a constant here. So if we integrate that with respect to x2, we have an x2 pop up right here. And we go, all right, plus the next component is a2x2. So if we're integrating with respect to x2, of course, the x2 becomes x2 squared. And we have to carry the 2 at the bottom or put the 2 at the bottom. And again, this is the first integral. And this is now evaluated on the bounds from 0 to 1. So from 0 all the way to 1. So if we substitute those values in. It's very quick to see that this becomes 2 times a1 plus a2 divided by 2. So again, this is just the first integral. Now we have to consider the second integral. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite our integral. But as you guys can see, it's, it's pretty simple what the answer is going to be. I know that there's a lot of shortcuts with integration, but uh, again, I'm pretty slow with integration. So uh, don't make fun of me too much. So if we consider what we have now, we still have the integral from 0 to 1. And now we have our function 2a1, 2a1 plus a2, all divided by 2. And then this is now with respect to dx3. Now. It's pretty simple because we're going to say, all right, well, this is going to be equal to 2a1 times x3. So again, if we integrate a constant, we just add the variable to it, plus a2 over 2. So again, this is now just a constant. So we, all we have to do is just add an x3, and that's it. And we look at our bounds. Well, our bounds here is from 0 all the way to 1. Therefore, we know that this is simply just going to be 2a2 or not a2, simply going to be, and yet I get it wrong, 2a1 plus a2 over 2. And that's our final answer, guys. So as you guys can see, it's not too bad. I know I was really slow with it. You guys can do this in a matter of seconds. I take a little bit more time. I'm, a, I'm pretty bad at integrals, guys. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty bad at integrals. But if I can do it, you guys can definitely do it. And that's how you solve question number two. Now, if you guys looked at the quiz, question number three, it's a little bit longer. So again, I'm going to go into Mathematica because I want to show you guys the Mathematica steps on how to use the Rayleigh Ritz method because this will help you guys in your guys' assignments. I want you guys to have a nice, easy time with the assignments. So anything I can do now to help, I'm going to do it. All right, guys, I'll see you guys in question number three. All righty, guys, welcome to question number three. As you guys are going to see with question number three, it's going to be a little bit longer than an average question. But it's very nice because it talks about the Rayleigh Ritz method as a whole. So if you guys understand question number three here, you guys are set for this topic and you guys' assignment will be a nice piece of cake. All right. So if we look at question number three, it says the shown beam has a constant cross sectional area of 0 0.25 units, a length L of five units, and is under a distributed axial load P 
of 300 units of force per unit length. It says the Young's modulus of the material is 20,000 units, and the question wants us to use the Rayleigh Ritz method to find a quadratic polynomial solution for the displacement function. So, as we can see in brackets here, it has a nice quadratic uh, function. And again, this is what we are assuming is our displacement function. Now, if we look at it right now, it doesn't look like anything special. So, the goal of using the Rayleigh Ritz method is to solve for A0 a1 and a2. Once we solve for them and throw them into here, we're hoping that we get somewhat of a reasonable approximation of the exact solution. So if we look at the beam down here, St. Clayton, why am I approximating this? This is a nice, easy differential equation. I can find the exact solution if I wanted to, and that's great. But as I mentioned, of course, in reality, this doesn't really work all the time. So we need to figure out how to find approximate solutions to these type of problems. All right. So we're going to do this uh, question here in Mathematica, and all the steps are exactly the same for this method. It can be a little bit more complex, uh, may need more terms, but in the end, the base steps are always going to be the same. So if you guys do a good job, listen here, your guys' assignment will be a piece of cake. All right, guys, I'll see you in Mathematica. All righty, guys, welcome to Mathematica. As we discussed, we're going to solve question number three of the quiz, and it's actually not too bad of a question. So all I've done thus far in Mathematica is to find our four parameters, which are the area, the length, the distributed load, as well as the Young's modulus, as well as to find our approximate displacement function u. So of course we're doing a nice quadratic displacement function, so therefore it's going to be a0 plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared. And the whole goal of the Rayleigh Ritz method is to determine what are these coefficients a0, a1, as well as a2, because once we know what those are equal to, we can just substitute them back into this equation and we have our approximate displacement. So the question again becomes, what is a0, what is a1, and what is a2? Now, what's nice about the rayleigh ritz method is it always follows the same steps. And the first step in that, talk, uh, define our essential boundary conditions. What are the essential boundary conditions? Well, as you guys remember from virtual work, Essential boundary conditions are those that relate to both rotation as well as displacement. Now, we have a very specific case on our hands here where we're dealing with a uniaxial beam. So everything's just going laterally. There's no bending. There's nothing like that. So in, in this case, we're only talking about displacement because, of course, if there's no bending, there's going to be no rotation. And if we look at the picture of the beam, we can see that we actually have two displacement boundary conditions, one on the left-hand side of the beam and one on the right hand side of the beam. As the beam is fixed in both of those sides, we know that there's going to be zero displacement on both sides of the beam. So what we do in Mathematica is we define these as boundary conditions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say boundary condition one. Well, this is the displacement function when x1 approaches zero. So this is the displacement at x1 is equal to zero. And we know that we have a second boundary condition, boundary condition two, which I'm going to call it, which is the displacement when x1 approaches l. So x1 approaches l. So at this point, I really haven't done anything. I just have my displacement equations at both ends of the beam. Luckily for us, we know that that displacement function at both ends of the beam are actually equal to zero. So the key here becomes is we can solve those two equations for two of the coefficients. So in general, actually, the amount of essential boundary conditions that you guys have is the amount of coefficients you guys can solve for in your approximate displacement equation. So if we look here, we have two essential boundary conditions. Therefore, I can solve for A0 as well as A1 almost immediately. How do we do this? Well, we go solve, which is our solution, because we're going to be using the solve function. So of course, the solve function, you input an equation, and you input what you want to solve for. Now, luckily for us, we have two equations, so we're going to use our squiggle brackets. Our first one, the boundary condition one, which is the displacement at x1 is equal to zero. Well, we know that that's going to be equal to zero. Similarly, the boundary condition two, which is the displacement when x1 is equal to L. Well, we know that this is also equal to zero. So since we have two equations, we can solve for two unknowns. So I'm going to put another set of squiggle brackets. Looking at our equation here, we have unknown a0 and we have unknown a1. So therefore, I can input those in, and once I run our code, what we can see is a0 is actually equal to 0, and a1 is equal to negative 5 multiplied by a2. So this is great. We have defined what a0 and a1 is. But at this point, we actually have a problem, because if I were to go a0 right now, which we know is 0, and run it, 
I just get a naught. This is a problem because we know that a naught is zero, but we have to tell Mathematica what our results were from the step above. So what I'm going to do is a naught is actually equal to a naught win, and I'm going to reference our result above. So I'm going to go sol at one comma one. So now when I go this, I can see that a naught is actually equal to zero, which is great. And I can do the same thing for a one. So if I were to run a one right now, I just get a one, which of course is not true. So we know that a one Oops, a1 is equal to a1 win, the solution, but this time we want the second one. So I'm going to suppress this and I'm going to run a1 again. Now we can see that a1 is actually defined as negative 5 multiplied by 2. And this is actually reflected in our parameters above. So if we look at u now, our approximation, we see that a0 is now defined because it's black and a1 is also defined. So now our only unknown coefficient is actually a2. And this is when we're going to start utilizing the rayleigh ritz method. But before that, we're going to go uh, back to the quiz here because the first part of the quiz says, what is the displacement function after the essential boundary conditions are applied? So what we're going to do is we're going to go simple, full simplify of our displacement equation. And of course, a0 and a1 are already defined. So if I run this, I get that our displacement equation right now after the essential boundary conditions is a2 multiplied by x1 multiplied by x1 minus 5. So if you guys look at the quiz, this is one of the answers, and this is the correct answer. But of course, we're not going to stop there. The quiz wants many more things. And if we look at the quiz, the next thing that it wants is it wants the strain component. So strain component epsilon 1, 1. Now, if we were dealing with an Euler-Bernoulli beam or a continuum, of course, the best way to do this would say, all right, well, I have my displacement function. I can find my displacement gradient, and then I can find my small strain tensor. And of course, if you guys use this here, it'll work perfectly. You guys will get the same answer. But the trick here is if we're dealing with uniaxial, so everything's just going in the one direction, our strain component 1, 1 is actually just equal to the derivative of our displacement function with respect to x1. So if you guys do the small strain tensor method, you guys will get the exact same answer. But if you guys realize that this is, of course, uniaxial, all we have to do is take the derivative of our displacement function with respect to x1. So if I run this, I get my strain component E11, or epsilon 11, is 2 multiplied by A2x1 minus 5 multiplied by A2. So if you guys look at the possible answers, this is going to be one of them which is great because now we can move on to the actual more difficult part, which is the total strain energy. So of course, when we're calculating that uh, potential energy of the system, the first component that we need to know is the total strain energy. And this is where things are going to get a little bit more complicated because the formulation for this is a bit more advanced. Now I'm going to display the formula for the total strain energy uh, up on the corner here. And I must note to you guys, please remember, this is the total strain energy equation for a bar under axial load. This is not for a continuum. This is not for an Euler-Bernoulli beam subjected to bending. This is for a specific case of a beam or a bar subjected to purely an axial load. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go total strain energy is equal to, and of course, judging from the equation, we know that we're going to need an integral. So integrate, uh, yes, so integrate. And what we're going to have to do is input two things. The first one is, what is the equation that we want to integrate? And the second one is, what are the bounds? So I'm going to have a comma here. The first part, what is the equation? Well, we can see above that the equation is simply E multiplied by A. And I forgot that I have it defined as EM. E multiplied by A divided by 2 multiplied by the derivative of our displacement function. So I'm going to have the derivative of our displacement function U with respect to X1. And this is actually going to be squared. All right, so this is, again, Got this right from the equation, substitute into Mathematica, nothing too crazy. Now the bounds, of course, are over the length of the beam. So what I'm going to do is the bounds is x1 is going from 0 all the way to L. All right, so all I did was take everything in the equation, substitute into Mathematica, and if I run this bad boy, I get that it's equal to 0. And if we look at the possible answers in the quiz, one of them is actually equal to 0, and this is where kind of the danger comes in. So if we actually look at my equation, I mistyped it. So if we look here, we're taking the derivative of our deflection function with respect to x1, not with respect to x2. So now if I change this to x1 and I run the same equation, I get the following, but it's a fraction. So I'm going to simplify it into a number. 
as you guys will see, I get 104,167 times A2 squared. If you guys look at the possible answers in the quiz, you guys will see that this is the exact same. But this is where I try and show you guys the tricks because, of course, one simple mistake here, you guys are getting a different answer. And fortunately, Dr. Samer knows exactly what types of mistakes you guys will make, and thus he puts them as a possible answer on the quiz. So if you guys look at the total strain energy, again, just substitute the formula in. Make sure that you guys are paying special attention to each one of the variables you guys are inputting. All right, so let's move on to the next part of the quiz, which is the work done by the external force. So I'm just going to put work done. You guys know what I'm talking about because we actually only have a single external force. Now, what's nice for us is the work done here by a distributed axial load is simply just another integral. So I'm going to put it up on the screen here. So we're going to want to integrate and we're just going to substitute the equation above again into our integral formula. So, of course, if we look at this, we're taking our distributed load, which is P, and we're multiplying this by our displacement function. It's as simple as that, nothing too crazy. The last thing that we need to do is define the bounds, which, of course, we're integrating over the beam. So we're going from x1 is equal to 0 all the way to x1 is equal to L. And it's that easy. So if I run this bad boy, I get that our total work done is negative 6,250 multiplied by A2. If you guys look at the quiz, that's one of the actual answers, so we're doing pretty good so far. Now, once you guys get to this point, it's actually pretty easy, because the next thing that the quiz wants is the potential energy of the system, which I'm going to call PE. Now, in order to find this, all we need to do is take our total strain energy, which we have as TSE, and we're going to subtract the work done on the system by the external loads. It's actually that easy, but at the same time, it's actually that hard, because if you mess up the total strain energy, or you mess up the work done by the system, well, you're getting the potential energy wrong. So if we run this bad boy, oh, and I guess I'll suppress this so we don't have to see it. And what I'll do is I'll put N at the end so we can see the exact answer. What we find is that the potential energy of the system is 6,258.2 plus 104,167 multiplied by A2 squared. All right, so this is the hardest part, finding this potential energy. Now what's left? All we need to do is solve for that A2 coefficient that's in both of them. So what I'm going to do is create another section, which I'm going to call solve for A2. And in order to do this, what we're going to do is take the derivative. Of course, as we mentioned, how do we find potential energy? Well, we take the derivative, uh, sorry, how do we find the coefficients using potential energy? Well, we take the derivative of that potential energy because, of course, we want that potential energy to be a minimum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, let's say uh, D of potential energy is simply the derivative of the potential energy. So the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the coefficient. So I'm taking the derivative of the potential energy with respect to A2. I'm going to run that and I'm going to get something like this. And you guys think, Clayton, well, this doesn't really tell us too much, but it does. And the reason why is this uh, derivative of the potential energy, since it's a minimum, this actually must be equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and I'm going to go solution two because why not is equal to the solve function. And we have an equation, which is the derivative of the potential energy, of course, is equal to zero. And I need to solve for a variable. I got one equation. I can do one unknown. So I can actually solve for a two. So what I can do is I can run this. And what I find is that a two approaches negative three over 100. So of course, this is one of the answers, but Dr. Samer gives it in a numerical uh, form. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to define A2 as A2 is equal to A2 when solution one, and when I'll go with A2 in a number format, we find, oops, sorry, made a little mistake here. This is salt two. <laughs> see, even I make a lot of mathematical mistakes, you guys will see. So what we find is that A2 is actually equal to negative 0.03. So if you guys look at your answers in the quiz, this will be one of them. Now that all the hard part is over, we solve for A0, A1, as well as A2. We can put our approximation equation. So I'm going to go approximation. And all we have to do is go full simplify our displacement function u. Because if we actually look at the top here at our displacement function u, a0 is defined, a1 is defined, as well as a2 is defined. So it's just going to be a function of x1, which is exactly what we want. So if I run this, I get that my approximation is actually 
Now, we'll throw it in number form just, just for fun. Negative 0 0.03 multiplied by x1 minus 5 multiplied by x1. So this is our approximation for the displacement of this equation. Now, I didn't calculate the exact solution, so I can't comment on how close it is, but you guys will actually do that in your assignment, I believe. So yeah, that's it, guys. This concludes question number three. I hope it helped you guys. And remember, the steps for the rayleigh ritz method are exactly the same. So if you guys follow these exact steps in your guys' assignment, everything should go nice and smooth. All right, guys, that concludes the quiz. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in quiz number 33, our very last quiz.